Okay, uh, first of all, I want to um, thank ISI again for giving me this opportunity and making me a fellow. And um, I was asked to uh, give a presentation and kind of emphasize what I think will be the future and what I think is important in the study of complex systems. And I decided in the next 12 minutes or so to focus on two things which I think are very much related to one another. They're not independent and that is predictability and patterns in complex systems. And I'm going to try to uh, convey this by talking about a few things that, that I've done in the past in my research. And uh, they're both systems that I'm going to talk about that are important in a globalized world that relate to the way we can unravel patterns in complex systems when we ap apply the right techniques. I will focus a little bit, or particularly on one issue that all, also Alex Vespignani is interested in in his groups in Vittoria, and that is understanding the spread of uh, pandemic diseases, among other things. I'm, I'm going to start with these three posters. Those are movies that appeared in the past couple of years. Some of you may have seen those, like Contagion, which is sort of a movie about what would happen if there is a pandemic with a high mortality rate. And then there is the, the rise of the planet of the apes. It's a kind of a prequel to the classic movies. And if you have seen this movie, right at the end, this, this movie is not about epidemics or pandemics, but right at the end there is an explanation why humanity disappears in this movie. And there's an, actually an animation which uh, very much looks like uh, the uh, simulations that Victoria and Alex do uh, concerning epidemics. And then, of course, there's this uh, World War Z movie, which is in the theaters right now in the US. I hear that it's not doing too well, but that is about a zombie pandemic. But all of these uh, movies, they, you know, share this idea that some sort of non-equilibrium system starts emerging, something is spreading and changing everything on a global scale. Now, before I uh, talk more specifically about this, I want to show you this slide. You know, every physicist has seen this before, and I think nothing more than these two systems symbolizes pattern and predictability more in physics. One is just a single simple pendulum which swings back and forth due to gravity. And it's a very regular and repetitive motion. And, and obviously, you know, if you just, any child will tell you that you can predict uh, the state of the system uh, in the future if you know the state in the present. And the pattern of motion is very regular and very similar to the motion of, say, and actually the math behind this is very similar to the pattern of, you know, planetary motion. But then also physicists, the physicists among you will know that if you ch just change this mechanically a little bit, the pendulum, and add a another joint there in the middle, the pattern changes qualitatively. It becomes chaotic, the pattern is more complex, and in fact, you see two pendula there. They started at almost the same initial condition, and after a short period of time, the motion is very different. And when you want to understand this system, and in fact, when you look at it the right way, there's a multitude of patterns hidden in this very simple mechanical system. Also, you know, an analogy to whatever, like planetary motion is for regular motion. If you look at weather and the dynamics of patterns and weather, they're also very chaotic and very hard to predict. But there's another thing. I want to show you this mechanical uh, system. It's actually essentially uh, like five simple driven pendula and if you put them, if you couple them in a specific way, the opposite happens. Right? Initially they're unsynchronized. This is very much related to what Duncan Watts mentioned yesterday, what he was interested in. You put them on this, on this board and they're coupled through these Coke cans and they synchronize. So there's like an emergence of a very regular pattern of a coupled system which is in a in a way, it's more puzzling than even the chaotic system. So having said this, I want to get back to disease dynamics. What you see here is a uh, simulation of a hypothetical pandemic disease, which is to model like the spread of uh, H1N1, for instance, so it had an initial outbreak in Mexico, and the spreading occurs on the worldwide air transportation network, very much uh, in the spirit of the sophisticated type of modeling that that is done at ISI, for instance. Now, when you, when you look at this pattern, it looks very different 
than what we would expect if we had some sort of regular spreading pattern, like in the lower right here. You know, this would be a pattern that you would see if you, you know, have a homogeneous uh, spreading process and if everything is just happening locally. Now, these patterns that emerge in global diseases that, you know, occur and propagate on these complex networks of transportation are more complicated. And the question is, you know, what is there? Is there an underlying hidden pattern. Now, if we want to understand this, it's not only important like in an academic sense, but also because, and that's the reason why there are so many movies out about this now, is that we live in a world where more and more people interact and they travel in a very different way than they used to. So there are more people and there's more mobility and the way we interact and the way we travel is a very complicated and complex system. And this is why it is important to understand these patterns. Now, that's a drawback, so there's a higher risk of the emergence of these kind of events, but there's also opportunities, some of which have been alluded to yesterday. You know, we have uh, technology now that collects lots of big data on, you know, how people interact, how they move around. I'm just showing you this picture of cell phones. All of these are geo-aware devices and you know, we can collect all this data and use it in order to better understand these processes. There are opportunities, but also dangers that were also discussed yesterday. Now, the first thing that one should do is, if we have all this data, if we just illustrate it in some way, it's very hard to see shape or pattern in this data. And I want to give you an example from like about 10 years ago that we did. This was like in 2005, where we collected some data which looks very complex, but there is hidden patterns in this data. And this is a, you know, it almost seems like a dec, you know, like a, you know, a century ago, but it's only like eight years ago. This was prior to the time when geo-aware data was analyzed, and we wanted to know something about human mobility in order to, you know, make better predictions about diseases. So we figured we can analyze data that was collected on an online bill tracking website. This online bill tracking website worked like this, so there's like bills that are registered and they travel and they get monitored and thereby you can, you know, construct this kind of proxy network for human mobility. And the question is, you know, if you look at it this way, it looks like just a complex network, but what are the hidden patterns in this? And one project that we did with this is we wanted to know if you look, say, at the United States, there are all these borders, state borders, for instance, geographic borders that, you know, evolved, you know, centuries ago, essentially. And now, the way we travel nowadays, if we understand this as a way how different places are coupled, you know, if there's lots of traffic, say, between this city and this city, these cities are actually close together. So one idea was that if we take this network, and just forget about these geographic borders that exist and pretend that all like these places in the United States are detached from their geography and now we're going to try to sort them into little groups such that you know places that are close together by because there's lots of traffic between them we're just going to put them in the same group there's a whole sort of theory behind this if you do this with a computer you can get these geographic patches or, you know, mobility-driven communities that no longer have anything to do, essentially, with uh, the borders that exist and emerged historically. Now, if you do this in a computer a bunch of times, every time you do it, you get a different map. That's not very satisfying. You know, if you have a scientific method and it gives you a different result every time you use it, that's not very good, okay? Now, the trick is, if you do this very, very many times, you will see all these maps that are extracted from this mobility network, or in this case, the network of money traveling, essentially. If you do this very many times, you will see that every time you do this and you just focus on the borders, there are certain patterns that re-emerge. So if you do this, say, a thousand times, and you get a thousand maps and you put them on top of one another, then you see structure emerging. This is a pattern that is not seen in the actual network. If you just look at the network, you don't see that. Now here's another picture of these borders. So these borders 
are just extracted or hidden in this uh, multi-scale mobility network. And you see sometimes they coincide with the actual geographic state borders and sometimes they don't. So these are human activity-driven mobility borders. Now let me get back to uh, disease dynamics, a topic that I actually wanted to focus on. This is a snapshot of uh, this amazing tool, and I stole the title from Alex and Vittoria, Mapping Out the Next Pandemic. They've been developing this amazing uh, simulation framework that you know, takes into account all tons of data on how people move from place to place on a global scale, and it's a tool where you can you know, essentially simulate your own pandemic, taking into account all this massive data. Okay, one of the key features that I wanted to uh, focus on here is though if you, if you do this and you run a simulation, this is a simulation that you show that you've seen earlier, what is the actual pattern in this? You know, if you, you, can, you can run the simulation and you can make a prediction, but is there some sort of simpler thing hidden in this that we don't see because we're looking at it in the wrong way? So the idea behind uh, something that I was interested in very recently is maybe it's just an issue of distance. Maybe we think about distance, geographic distance in the wrong way nowadays. Okay, so let's focus on, on these couple of nodes in this worldwide air transportation network. Let's say you're in New York and places like Pittsburgh and Raleigh, Durham, and North Carolina are geographically very close to you. But there's very little traffic. On the other hand, London Heathrow and Frankfurt, they're very far, but there's lots of traffic. So intuitively, maybe this is the wrong way of looking at things. Maybe it's better to look at the whole system this way. Maybe New York is much closer to the European metropolitan areas because there's more traffic. And in fact, you can write down an equation for this, which is not so important, but the, the general idea is what happens if we just remap the world such that if there's lots of traffic, these places are closer. Now, if you do this, and you know, let's take Chicago as an example, that's where I live. That's now in the center, this airport, uh, O'Hare. And you see all these other places in the world, now not in a geographic map, but now using an effective distance. For instance, London Heathrow over here is much closer to Chicago than some of the places in the US. And now this like radial distance is this effective distance. This is another example. This is Turin. You see it's very close to Rome and Charles de Gaulle in Paris and Frankfurt and so forth. So now you can go to any, on any place in this, in this network and you can look at the world using this better or more intuitive notion of distance. Well that's fun, but what happens if we Look at a simulation uh, of, an, of a pandemic in this new picture. Okay, here's two simulations. The top one is a pandemic that started, a hypothetical pandemic that started in Atlanta. And the lower one was a video of a pandemic that started at some other place. And the right frames, they look at this in the usual conventional geographic uh, map. But on the left, you see the representation in this effective distance. And what looks complicated on the right looks very simple, like a sort of concentric spreading wave that any child can understand uh, in this effective distance. So there's actually, in these complex dynamic patterns that we sometimes simulate or look at, uh, a very simple pattern hidden if we look at it in the right way. Now that's just not uh, a fun game to play and, you know, some sort of nice answer to an academic question, but this is, there's actually, this is very useful information because it turns out that this, in this particular case, only from the right location does it look like a concentric spreading pattern. So if you, were, if you had a spreading pattern like in the top left and you didn't know where the origin was, you can, you know, look at various candidate origins and only from the right origin does it look like a concentric pattern? The basic idea behind this is just like when you throw a rock into water and you see concentric ripples, any child will tell you after you have thrown the rock where the rock hit the water because it's only there from that perspective it's concentric. So wrapping this up, I think I have like a couple of seconds left. 
I think it would be a, a great philosophy in, to pursue in complex systems research to combine this idea of predictability and patterns, and they're, they've always been intertwined, and I think particularly in these complex dynamic phenomena, it's important to always take your time and uh, you know, develop specific perspectives and, and see if there's something hidden in this complex pattern that may look complex in a conventional way, but may be very simple after all. Thank you very much. Thank you.